it's now with a scripture time. So this morning as we get together and we open our Bibles to Psalms 96, this would probably be a good time for you to get in the habit of bringing your Bible. So if that scripture means something to you, you can outline it. Just listen, follow along. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and glory are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to His name. Bring an offering and come into His court. Worship the Lord in the thunder of His holy, of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for He comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in truth. And the Lord adds blessing to the reading of His Word this morning. Well, good morning, church. How you doing? Are you doing all right? A little sleepy? A little awake? All right. Are you ready to believe? All right. We're starting a new series today. Uh, we've had a couple of weeks of introductions on how to change your life today. What is it that we need to believe? We said it's important to change the way you think what you believe, and so I'm so excited that you're here. If you're new with us today, there's a connection card inside your bulletin, your worship guide, if you want to get that out, and then go ahead and get out the note-taking guide that'll help you follow along today. Uh, but uh, we would just love to get a little bit of information. You can just even put your first name in an email contact. We'd love to follow up with you and just see what you thought of the service today and how we can improve and just sharing God's Word with people. So that is our passion, that we would help people understand God's Word and so today, uh, we're going to be looking at the most important belief of all, where we start with, who does it always start with? God. It starts with God. And so we're going to be looking at what we believe about God, because uh, it's, it's just so crucial to everything in our life. And so, um, look at what A.W. Tozer says. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. So the Lord just says, God... What comes in your mind? What do you think about? What is your image? What is your picture? What is your uh, view of who God is? Uh, because what we believe about God determines how we live and how we treat people and, and how we do life. It, it, it shapes our worldview and everything that we do. And so today we have this belief, and we're going to say our number one belief beginning off today is that we believe that the God of the Bible is the only true God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, help me say that together. Here we go. I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God that has revealed yourself to us. That we don't have to guess about who you are, that you've given us your word, that you've given us your Son, that you revealed, that you've made it known who you are and that you would want to even have a relationship with us. Father, we're blown away this morning. We're excited to be able to dig into your word and learn more about who you are and what you've done. And just pray that you would guide us, that you would just lead us, and that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit as we learn from you in Jesus' name. Amen. So imagine a little girl in her room during the thunderstorm. How many of you love thunderstorms? Oh, yeah. Some of you do. How many of you hate them? So the thunder booms, and as you probably relived in your own life and with your kids several times, little girl jumps up out of her bed, runs into her mom and dad's room, and says, Mommy, I'm scared. I want to sleep with you. <laughs> right? And 
Mom's like, you know, dear, it's just a thunderstorm, and, and you're going to be safe. Go back to your room. God will be with you. Just go to sleep and just pray. God will be with you. So the little girl thinks about it, and she says, you know, Mommy, I think I'm going to stay in here and sleep with Daddy. You go in my room and sleep with God. <laughs> it, it illustrates how hard it is for us to wrap our arms around this idea of God, right? Because God, we've got revealed in Scripture, we know the stories of Jesus, but when it comes right down to it, some of us, most of us even struggle at different times in our life. Okay, I know there is a God, but boy, it'd be real nice if He was sitting right next to me, right? Like you could touch Him. That's what the disciples had. And so it's really hard for us to put our minds around this big and this awesome God. And God has revealed Himself in Scripture, and that makes it a joy for us today to be able to kind of really dig into this. So we've got three big ideas. Big idea number one, God exists. So on your note-taking outline there, God exists. And uh, it's interesting, in this world, <clears throat> despite all you hear about atheism, uh, there's only about 2 to 8% of the entire population of the world that does not believe there is a God. It's a very small percentage of people that are absolutely convinced and would stake their life on the fact that there is no God. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people say, well, probably is, but I don't know. And lots of different views on it, but there's a small percentage that says that there is no God. Even after all the scientific evidence, even in this technological age that we live in, most people will even give you the fact that, yeah, there's probably a God. God exists. So big idea number one, God exists. If you have... Uh, a few doubts in yourself, if you have some skeptical friends, I'm just going to give you two quick things. One, to understand that God exists, one thing you can do is at nighttime, especially, you can look up. And you probably have to drive out of the city to do it. To see the universe that is there. Uh, have you ever seen the pictures from the Hubble telescope? Look at this picture up here. You can kind of barely see it with all our light in here. That is a picture of our galaxy. Each one of those bright things is a star. And you, you know our sun, and there's this whole galaxy, or you know, grouping of planets around the star. There's literally just like millions and millions of galaxies out there, and, and we're just a little speck in all of this. It is so amazing to believe that that would all happen by random things happening. I mean, where does something that expansive come from? It has to come from somewhere, doesn't it? And so scientists now are coming back again to the same thing they've said before, that uh, either Big Bang, but then they have to explain where uh, something came from nothing, which is really hard because we have no experience of that. And then the other thing they have to believe is that, well, it's just always been there. It's just eternally existed. Who does that sound like? God. <laughs> so like the definition of God. It is replacing in your scientific mind uh, a God that's personal, that's revealed himself in Scripture with a God that's the universe. It's a physical universe that's eternal. And so, you can look up. The psalmist says it this way. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. If you will do some investigation, if you're a scientific person, you can dig deep into that. You can see evidence of God all over the universe. You can also look deep inside ourselves. You go down to the cellular level of human beings, in one single cell, the DNA that there's just one example of how you can prove that God exists. And this cannot happen by chance or by accident. Uh, here's a strand of DNA you can kind of visualize there. Uh, in each one of those cells, there are three billion pairs of information of DNA. Three billion. It's hard to wrap our minds around what that means, uh, but it's like 1.5 million pages of information. How big is that book? That's a big book. So what you're saying is you're saying, I believe by chance, somehow this book got written inside of each one of our cells. I mean, imagine the possibility of this book writing itself. How many pages? A thousand? 1.5 million pages writing itself inside of each one of our cells. It just cries out, there has to be a designer. There has to be some intelligence behind this to put it all together. So we can say with a lot of confidence, despite all the scientific uh, rhetoric out there, that God exists. God exists. And, and that's exactly where the Bible starts. We just love the Bible. Genesis 1, uh, verse 1, simply says, in the beginning, what? 
God. It starts with the assumption God exists. In the beginning, God. Just a great start. How does God introduce Himself when He's talking to Moses? He says, Moses, and He's like, well, okay, you're God, but who should I tell them they're sending me? What did He call His name? He said, just tell them that I am. I exist. I'm the God who exists. The I am sent you. So the key question here this morning is not, is there a God? Because even the Bible warns us against that, puts it rather bluntly in Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Bible says, but that's the kind of foolish if you push this too far, to think that there's not a God. When you look at all the evidence, when you look at everything that's there, and of course, spiritually, it's a foolish thing to do, to ignore the God of the universe. We're going to put Romans chapter 1, verse 20 on the screen for you in just a minute here. Uh, but I want to read back in verse 18. If you're real quick, you can turn there, but we're going to get through it pretty quick. Romans 1, 18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Now verse 20, how did He show it to them? For His invisible attributes Namely, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. The Bible puts it very bluntly. God has revealed Himself to the extent that every person on the planet, when they look up and they think about who they are and they see the things around, that there's obvious evidence that there is a God who exists, who designed it. And because of that, there is no excuse. It's interesting to think on Judgment Day, standing before the God of the universe, there will be no non-believers. Everyone will believe at that point that God exists, that He is who He said He is. They might still be in rebellion, they might still be in rejection, and they're going to spend eternity with Him if they don't know Him, or without Him if they don't know Him. But everyone will come to the realization that God exists. So if God exists, the next question that comes up, well, which God? We've got the God of the Muslims, we've got the God of the Mormons, we've got the God of all these people, we've got the Buddha, we've got all these, we've got people, there's some guy out in Siberia right now claiming that he's God. Uh, there's people and views everywhere, so which God? And that's where we come to our lesson today. Our second big idea is that the God of the Bible is the only true God. Big statement. Many people will be okay with the fact that you believe that there's a God that exists. When you go to this next level and say, I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, you're setting yourself apart from a lot of different people. So what does Psalm 95 verse 3 say? For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all God. When God speaks of Himself, when He talks, He you might not know, but there's like 4,200 different religions that are kind of estimating in the world. Like 4,200 different deities and things that people worship. And God acknowledges that and says, I, I get the fact that you guys believe in a lot of different gods. Here's what I'm saying. is what God is saying. I'm above all of them. I am the one true God. And all of these other gods are false. That's pretty powerful stuff. I'm going to go to our third big idea because it really illustrates this unique God of the Bible, the only true God. And that's the last half of our belief statement today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've come up with a word to kind of describe that. We call it the Trinity. The Trinity. One God and three persons. Now, we don't have time to unpack this all the way so that you can understand the Trinity. In fact, the Trinity is kind of a lifelong pursuit to really fully grasp it and understand it uh, because it's so God, it's so up other than us. And that's why, uh, you know, we sang today, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And our normal thought process for Holy, Holy, Holy is like He's perfect. He's morally perfect. He never does anything wrong, which is true. So He's Holy, Holy, Holy that way. The other meaning of holy is that He's wholly other. He's wholly different than anybody else. There's no one like Him. 
He set apart is kind of the meaning of the word. Sanctified, holy, set apart. God is set apart from everything else. The Trinity illustrates that. And you say, well, I don't see the Trinity. Uh, remember in Genesis, you started with creation, and you, in the beginning, God, who's hovering over the surface of the earth, over the water? The Spirit of God. We go to John chapter 1, and uh, the apostles taught that Jesus, the Word of God, was there in the beginning. Nothing was made that was made that wasn't made without Him. Jesus was there at creation. You've got God the Father, you've got God the Spirit, and you've got God the Son all involved in creation from the very beginning of the Bible. Uh, a verse that we'll uh, just to put the reference on the screen for you. Genesis 1, 26. A curious verse. Because God is speaking here and He says, Let us make man in our own image. Who's He talking about? He's talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's community there. Try you and God. Let us make man. Another hint from Scripture. There's just a great illustration. And we won't take time to turn to it today, but Matthew 3, it's in Luke as well, um, it says Jesus being baptized. So he comes up to John the Baptist and says, hey, you should baptize me too so we can do everything right. John's like, no way, you should baptize me. This is all backwards. And Jesus says, no, we're going to follow this. I want to be an example. And he says, I'm going to get baptized. So Jesus gets baptized. What comes down like a dove? The Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, as Jesus comes out of the water, second person of the Trinity, third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit comes down on him like a dove. And then what happens? Out of heaven, God speaks the Father and says, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. You got all three persons of the Trinity involved in the baptism of Jesus. And so the Trinity, as, as difficult as it is, is, is all throughout the pages of Scripture. Our theme Scripture that we've already talked about today is 2 Corinthians 13, 14, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul is reiterating the whole triune God. Jesus, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. So now we get down to the brass text. So how do we prove that this God is who he says he is? How do we prove that the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Well, God has given throughout history an answer that's different than kind of the answer that we search for in some respects in our culture. Uh, we're constantly looking for all these scientific things and, and all these experiments that we might be able to do to explain God. And, and God doesn't give us a scientific experiment. There's, there's scientific evidence for the existence of God and that it, what He says is true. And you can look at prophecies, you can look at all kinds of things. The science is there. But you know the evidence that God gives? He's done it all through history. He gives individuals the personal experience of knowing who He is. And he does that through two primary ways. ways. A statement on your outline here. God's truth is in His promises. And His promises kept. So God proves Himself all through the Bible to the people that He reveals Himself to. says, look, I am the God that exists. I am. I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. And He makes a promise. And then He fulfills that promise. He tells Abraham, I'm going to choose you. You guys are going to be my group. And I'm going to bless you. And He fulfills that promise. And we'll look at some of that. So God's proof is in His promises kept and in His power unleashed. So He keeps His promises, and He unleashes His power to prove that He is the only true God. We're going to look at a couple of those instances today. So now we'll go to our text. If you, we're going to have two major texts today. Actually, three. Go to Joshua chapter 24. Old Testament. We'll put the page numbers on the screen there. Uh, Joshua chapter 24. And there should be a Bible underneath one of the chairs around you. Joshua chapter 24 is the very last chapter of Joshua. So Joshua was Moses' right-hand man uh, that uh, took over after Moses died and was helping to get the people to the promised land. They get to the promised land and God is all the way through keeping His promises uh, to His people, even though they consistently fail. And we'll read through these first five verses to give a little bit of a context here. So it's coming to the end of Joshua's life. 
and he's wanting to gather the people and kind of renew this covenant, these promises, and rehearse the power that God has unleashed in their past. So Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to check them and summon the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham, of Nahor, and they served other gods. So they were serving one of those 4,200 other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring me. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of them, and afterward I brought you out. What's he rehearsing with them right now? His promises kept and his power unleashed. He said, I promised Abraham I would make a nation. The nation got stuck in Egypt, and, and I had to bring him out of that slavery. So I promised you I would bring you out of that to a promised land. And then I unleashed my power. Remember, even if you've seen at least the movie, The Ten Commandments, you see all these plagues coming down on Egypt until they finally let them go. And then all through the wilderness, they're going to all these experiences. They're like, God, we're out of food. God makes food come on the ground. They're like, God, we're out of water. Makes it come out of a rock. This is power unleashed, proving that He is the one true God. So Joshua is rehearsing this with all the people. God keeps His promise. If you fast forward about 500 years and you know the story of Israel, you know that that's not always the case that they're following Him. The way he's keeping his promises with them. Go to the book of First Kings. Just go to the right. You're going to hit uh, First and Second Samuel. First and Second Kings. So go to First Kings chapter eighteen. There's this great story that just demonstrates the power of God. Uh, just in such a dramatic way. So one of the promises that God made to His people that they did not keep on their end is He said, if you'll worship Me, I will bless you and I'm going to take care of you. But if you run after these other gods that are not the one true God, then I'm going to have to discipline you to bring Me back to you so we can be together, so we can have this relationship. And what happens with the people of Israel is constantly they run after these other gods. And one of the ways they do that is by marrying people from these other countries who are worshiping these other gods. And King Ahab makes the big mistake of marrying Jezebel. And Jezebel uh, does not follow God, follows this God called Baal or Baal. It's, it's a God that just has all this uh, immorality involved with it and just some really sick worship involved with it. And so Ahab gets all of Israel to start following these, and, and they're mixing both together. And as you can imagine, uh, that's not something that God was happy about. Look at verse 21. God sends this prophet, prophet Elijah, to confront the people. And Elijah comes near to all the people and he says, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people did not answer him a word. They didn't know what to say. They were kind of trying to follow both. And now he's making them make a choice. And what goes on in this story, this is a great passage just to read and just to soak up, and we don't have time to go through every bit of it this morning. But here is Elijah, and he calls out the people and says, okay, let's find out who is the one true God. Let's build some altars. You guys build one for your God named Baal, and I'm going to build one for the one true God, and we're going to see which God answers by fire and brings fire out of the sky to burn up the sacrifices on the altar. So they, they get all their things ready, and first the, the gods of, or the priests and prophets of Baal come out, and they, they do all their dances, and they're running around, and they're trying to get God, their God, to answer by fire, and nothing's happening. And if you want to read some humor in the Bible, you can watch Elijah kind of make fun of them all of us. He basically says, well, hey, maybe just you need to shout a little louder. He's on a little trip or something. And at one point he even says, maybe he's in the bathroom relieving himself, and he just can't come out right now. 
And, and they get really desperate. They start cutting themselves. They've got all kinds of rituals that they're going through to try to make this God, who doesn't exist, bring down fire on this altar. And if you know the story, you know what happens with Elijah. And he says, okay, now it's my turn for one true God. He says, let's go get some big buckets of water. And he dumps water after water after water and soaks this altar so it's soaking wet. And then he prays this awesome prayer and says, God, show yourself. Unleash your power because of the promises that you kept. And what happens? Boom. The whole thing lights up. And God just consumes it with fire. And everybody's like, not the real God. Real God. Okay, we're right here with this guy. I mean, it was good. He kept his promise and he unleashed his power and the people saw it. And so that at that point, they made a turn and they got rid of all these prophets of Baal and they tried to go the right direction. And of course, if you know the story of the history of Israel, they, they kind of go right back and do the same thing. Sounds a little bit like us sometimes. And we follow the wrong thing. I want to take you now to the New Testament. Go to the book of Acts. You're going to have to go to the right a whole bunch. Put some page numbers on the screen. The book of Acts is like the story of the church. So Jesus comes, he lives, he dies, he's resurrected, he goes back to heaven, and he leaves these uh, 12 apostles after they vote a new one in to go out and be the leaders and start spreading this gospel around. And then Paul comes in uh, after he is we see this vision of Christ and God, God just reveals himself to him. He becomes basically probably the most powerful missionary that this world has ever known. And Paul goes out and he's doing all this missionary work, telling people about this one true God. And he ends up in Athens. And of course in Athens, everybody's all, you know, into their Greek learning. And they're doing all these things. And then they got all these gods too. So he gets there and he has this, uh, basically a temple where they've got all these gods standing up, and they've made idols to them, so little statues of all these gods. And you can kind of imagine in your mind kind of that whole Greek thing and the pillars and all of those old things. And so they've got all these idols standing up there. They, they're so uh, particular about how they worship all these gods that they wanted to make sure they got them all. And so what they did was they made one that was for the unknown god, just in case they missed one. Right? Because their view and relationship with God was a little bit different than the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible keeps His promises. He's got covenant love. He keeps coming after us. And He unleashes His power for our good. He disciplines us, yes. But He's always looking for our good. These other gods, you're basically trying to live life so you don't get them mad. And if they get mad, they're probably going to do something. So every thunderstorm, everything that happens is like, oh, we must have made the God mad, so let's do this different. And so, of course, in case we skip one and he's really, really mad, let's make an idol to the unknown God. And then we'll have it covered. I don't know why they thought maybe he would be happy that they didn't even know his name, but uh, they wanted to make sure he was covered. Go to verses 30 and 31 of chapter 17. Verses 30 and 31. Going back up to 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by an art or an imagination of a man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to pretend, to repent. So what basically Paul is doing, he's saying, guess what? I know who your unknown God is. The God that you're skipping is the one true God of the Bible. And he goes and he tells him the whole story of who this God is. How he came, how Jesus came, how he lived and how he died, how he was resurrected again. And so we get to verse 31. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Who's that man? Jesus. And of this he has given assurance to all. So he's saying, in your NIV version, he'll say, has given proof to all. So here we're going to find out, how do you prove that the God of the Bible is the one true God? You don't need to look any further than this. Paul's going to tell us. God's given assurance. He's given proof to all by doing what? Raising Him from the dead. The one proof of God's promise kept, His power unleashed, 
is revealed most definitely in who? Jesus Christ. And so you don't really have to go very much farther at all in all of your theology and everything else. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, you know what? If the resurrection is not true, we're basically a bunch of idiots because we're getting beat up, we're getting tortured, we're getting killed because we're saying Jesus rose from the dead. And if that's not true, we're the most to be pitied in all this world because that would just be lunacy to go around teaching and preaching this stuff when it's not true. And so he's saying, we've seen Christ. He's saying, this is the most important thing of all. As God gets to the pinnacle of his revelation of himself, he says, here is my son. You want to know who I am? What I'm like? How I keep my promises? How my power is unleashed? You see it in Jesus Christ. And so here's Jesus raised from the dead. So you don't have to look any farther. It's God's ultimate proof. So here's a, a long sentence to help you kind of put this all together. God proved He was your God when He kept His promise. He kept His promise to you by providing the way back to Him through who? Jesus Christ. So God proved He was your God. If you're sitting here this morning saying, well, I don't know if I buy into this whole God of the Bible thing if He's the one true God or not. I think maybe that's just a little harsh and we should have maybe several ways to get to God. God's saying, no, I am the only way. Jesus said He was the only way, the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through Him. So God proved He was your God when He kept His promise to you by providing a way back to Him through Jesus Christ. God's ultimate proof is in His Son. Second statement, God proved He was your God when He unleashed His power and raised Jesus from the dead. So if God proves Himself all throughout Scriptures, all throughout the history of man, He's saying, here, you want to know if I'm real? I'm going to make you a promise. And you're going to find out this promise is going to be true. And I'm going to unleash my power to prove that it's true. And so we see that happening all throughout the story of the Bible. And then here comes Jesus. I promise to send a Savior, someone who would die for your sins. And here I sent Jesus. And now He's risen from the dead to prove that He is God. So you really only have to answer one question this morning to know whether or not the God of the Bible is the only true God. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? The entire book of the Bible rests on that one promise, on that one claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And so for us, it's time to declare what we believe. It's time to say, am I all in on that? Do, do I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? That the God of the Bible is the one true God? Romans 10.9, just love putting it together with this. It says, uh, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. So it's the most important question. What do you believe about Jesus? There's a few things on that very end of your note-taking outline. It says, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. You might be here this morning, you've never really fully committed to that statement, that, that Jesus is the Son of God, that He did live His life, that He did die on the cross, that He did rise from the dead. You can have salvation today if you just put your faith, your trust, completely in that. Not in your own good work, not in fulfilling some kind of checklist that you have to do to, to get on God's good side. Uh, that's the way those other nations felt. i got to make God happy or He's going to squash me. The only way you make God happy is by trusting in His Son. It's a free gift. Second statement says, I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God. Right, here comes some of the implications of this. If that's true, if He is God, then what does that mean about me? I am not. And I, I have to live my life with some accountability, with some humility to the one true God. I am not the master of my own destiny. I don't get to choose every day what I want to do. If He is God, and He's the one true God, then I have to check and see what He wants me to do. How does He want me to live my life? And I believe that that's probably the number one reason why there's so many atheists, because they get that. If there is a God that made everything and rules everything, I probably need to listen to Him. And I really don't want to. 
I hope that's not you this morning. I hope you're in a place of humility. The Bible calls that repentance to believe that the God of the Bible is the only true God. And this one's hard to wrap your mind around, but it says, I believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And huge implication from this. God exists in community, doesn't He? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's why we say in our values, I cannot do life alone. God has not created me. When He created Adam, what did He say? It's not good that you are alone. Everything was good. Everything was even very good. He says, it's not good that you're alone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create somebody to be with you. It doesn't mean we all have to be married, but it means we're all designed to have relationship with one another. So if you're living an isolated Christian life right now, you're probably struggling. Or you're walking away from God and you don't know you're struggling. Because we're not meant to do life alone. On your connection card, there's just some opportunities for you to really think through this. So I believe in the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe you'd just like to make that declaration and put that on there and put it in the connection box as you go out today. Then the next one says, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus for the first time. Maybe this is the first time you've recognized that Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead. God has given me all the proof I need to believe in Him. You want to put your faith in Him. Maybe you believe that, but you've never really uh, had a commitment towards that or expressed that or publicly confessed that. That's what baptism is all about. So we're getting ready, or hopefully you even have a baptism on Mother's Day. And so if that's something that you're thinking about, something that is on your heart, I know we've got some kids working through it right now, and there's a few adults that need to work on it too, maybe baptism is where you're at today. So as I pray for you, I just want you to think what the Lord would have you do. What's your next step in your journey of understanding who God is? Father, we thank you that you are an awesome God, that the heavens declare who you are, that there's there's no uh, accident that we're here, but it's by your design. And Father, you ordained even this moment right now that we would have this opportunity to reflect on who you are and how you've revealed yourself to us, how you've kept your promises in bringing Jesus, how we can see his power in the resurrection, that he is living again. We see his power in the changed lives. And so we thank you for that. I pray that each person here would just really deal with the things that God is putting on their heart. And as we worship, as we make this declaration, this I believe, I believe in the God of the Bible, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.